we are organizing this program on Zoom and it is being broadcast live on Facebook page of Martin Chotari. The title of today's discussion is Temporalities, Anticipation, Crisis, Orientations Toward the Future in Lapsi. And our main guest, uh, our main speaker is Nadine Lap Placha. I hope I have spelled correctly. Uh, she is postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Geography and Planning, University of Toronto. Uh, let me introduce her. Trained in social anthropology and global studies, she seeks to contribute to critical debates on citizenship and ethnicity, as well as infrastructure, disaster, and the environment. Our research is based on long-term ethnographic engagement in South Asian borderlands, particularly in Nepal where she worked as Heidelberg University's South Asia Institute for five years from 2014 to 2019. Uh, as usual, we have divided uh, today's program into two phases. In the beginning, our main speaker will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes. Second, in the second phase, uh, we will open our floor and we will then uh, audience can put questions and comments. Uh, in this phase, uh, those who are connected through Facebook uh, can use comment box to write their question and comments. And those are on Zoom can use raise an option or write down their questions and comments on chat box. We have a notice. Our next program will be on 1 June 2021. And the title is Discrimination of Abortion in Nepal or Necessity. And our speakers are Bandana Upreti from I, I pro bono and Samana Kafle from Law and Policy Forum for so Social Justice. Now, I request our speaker uh, for her presentation. Please, Nadine. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Hasha, for your kind introduction um, and for the invitation to present aspects of my current research at a Martin Chowdhury webinar. It's great that we could find a time that works for you in Kathmandu and uh, for me in Toronto. Please give me a moment to set up uh, my screen sharing. Now you all should be able to see my slides, right? Perfect. Um, as the title of my presentation indicates, I want to explore how people reassess their expectations of the future within a situation of crises. I look at Lapchi, a borderland village and region within the Gauri Shankar Conservation Area of Northern Dolaka District in Nepal. People in Lapchi are dependent on grasslands and economic exchange across the border in China. But the border has remained closed since the earliest weeks of the coronavirus outbreak, generating plausible fear of overgrazed pastures, food shortages, and substantial loss of income. In addition to the current moment of the global pandemic, the increasing border securitization all across northern Nepal has led to profound moments of rural transformation in the region. Lapchi residents are now pulled by these dynamics in numerous effective ways that indicate how future oriented action shape social, economic and material relations in the present. Most important to current reorientations is the widespread anticipation of a future hydropower project and access road in the region that will generate alternative economic opportunities by connecting Lapchi to the national road network and electric grid. In what follows, I attempt to show that anticipation is more than simply expecting something to happen. In fact, anticipation is the act of looking forward that also pulls us in the direction of the future and prepares the groundwork for the future to occur in the present. In Lapchi, these hopes and expectations for infrastructural development are, however, very much uncertain and open-ended. 
But as I seek to demonstrate uh, today, in moments of austerity, living and working toward possible futures may provide a way to deal with stress and anxieties. The dimensions of everyday temporalities in Lapchi can therefore provide the foundation for a broader consideration of how people experience, interpret, and react to ongoing ruptures in a borderland region. My research is based on several visits uh, to Lapchi and ongoing conversations with members of the Lapchi community who live in Kathmandu. I first went to Lapchi in 2012 and the most recent trip to the region was a couple of months ago uh, in March this year, just before the COVID situation uh, became very dire uh, in Nepal, as we all know. I will first locate Lapchi in its geographical and historical context to help understand how feelings of belonging across the Nepal-China borderland define social and economic practices in the region. I will then talk about the current border management and securitization. And finally, I focus attention on different orientations toward the future in Lapchi in order to illustrate the ways in which members of the local community react to recurring situations of austerity. My analysis is based on the anthropology of borders and borderlands with a special focus on the literature on disasters and the vulnerabilities they produce and reproduce. I also draw on recent studies on the future, which is an important new field in anthropology. And in particular, I follow Rebecca Bryant and Daniel Knight here, who worked with different temporal orientations, such as anticipation, expectation, speculation, potentiality, and hope, which all represent different ways in which the future may affect our present. But where is Lapchi located exactly? Here you can see a map of Dolaka district in the context of Nepal. And another one that provides you with a close up of the region I'm going to talk about today. Lapchi is a village situated at around 3,800 meters at the border with China's Tibet Autonomous Region, the TAR. The village consists of an ethnically mixed Sherpa and Tibetan population that live in around 25 houses, which are spread out over a large terrain on the spur of a mountain. Because of the area's reputation as an important Buddhist pilgrimage site associated with the Tibetan yogi and poet Milarepa, a significant number of nuns and monks live in caves and wooden huts on the mountain overlooking the village. And a lot could be said about the sacred geography of Lapchi Kang or Lapchi Snow Mountain as the region is also called, but I won't go into much detail here. Lapchi currently is only accessible on foot and the nearest road is located a two-day walk to the south in Lama Bagar, a Sherpa settlement along the Tamakoshi River that is also depicted on the map here. This road to Lama Bagar was built to facilitate access to the nearby Upper Tamakoshi hydroelectric project and it is at the large dam site where the trail to Lapchi actually begins. Walking through a narrow gorge along the Tamakoshi River and continuing northwest, one first reaches Lumnang, which is situated at an altitude of around like 2,700 meters. Being in a still relatively warm climate, Lumnang is the winter settlement of the Lapchi community. Between Lumnang and Lapchi then are pastures or grazing grounds, which like Lapchi village itself, are used as settlements during the summer months for livestock herding. So life in the region is organized around the seasonal migration of animals and pastures extend up into the TAR to the west and east of Lapchi. Both border crossings are not more than an hour away from the village. Interestingly, high annual rainfall does not allow for agriculture in the area. In fact, there are no agricultural fields at all, except small patches um, with cabbage and potatoes here and there. So livestock herding really is the main income generator for the local community. 
people sell cattle and cattle products to the Tibetan town of Tashikang, where the closest market is located. And with the money earned, they purchase food supplies, basically rice, wheat, barley, and buckwheat, but also clothes, shoes, and household appliances. People very much depend on access to Tashikang, as the condition of the walking trail to Lama Baga is not in good shape. The trail was repaired after the earthquake, but sections of it are still washed away during monsoon each summer, cutting the region off from the rest of Nepal for several months at a time. And this is a picture taken from the highest pilgrimage sites um, at Lapchi Mountain. You can see Lapchi village on the right with the food trail to Tashikang in what is actually the northwest of the village. And then there is Lapchi monastery, Chura Gepeling in the center with the walking path to Lama Baga in the south. And if you follow the river towards the east next to the monastery, um, there's the other border that people cross for its rich grazing grounds. Let me now say a few words on Lapchi's historical context, as the region has a very interesting past that stretches across the borderland and is of great importance for the argument I want to develop in this presentation. Before the 1960s, Lapchi was considered part of Tibetan territory, while Lumnang belonged to Nepal. When I talked with 86-year-old Tashi Dolma, for example, who lives with um, other um, elderly people near Lapchi Monastery. She recounted the following. Every spring, when the snow had melted, we packed our belongings onto our animals and went to Lapchi, where we spent the summer months producing butter, curd, and cheese. When the first cold winds arrived, we went back to Lumnang, and some of us would stay with the cattle for another month at pastures along the way. We knew there was a border in between the villages, but it was of no relevance for us. Lapchi's distinct border situation is acknowledged by others passing through the area even before Tashi Dolma was born. Henry Morshead, a member of the 1921 British Reconnaissance Expedition to Mount Everest, observed in particular with regard uh, to tax payments of the local community. And I cite, the village, like Lapchi, is deserted during the winter month when the whole population migrates across the border into Nepal. The Tibetans pay no taxes to Nepal during their half yearly sojourn in the lower valley Conversely, the Nepalis during their summer residence in Lapche are not subject to Tibetan taxation. The Tibetans of Lapche pay their taxes in the form of butter direct to Lapche monastery, the head lama or abbot of which resides at Pudugompa near Nyalam. The Nepal frontier is some 10 miles below Lapche, opposite the snow peak of Karpo Bumri. Kathmandu can be reached in eight days, but the track is bad and very little trade passes this way. And this map here, or this part of a map uh, that I enlarged and that was originally published by the Survey of India in 1932 and then reproduced by the British War Office in 1953, also confirms that the border ran uh, between Lapchi and Lumnang villages. Um, you can see Lapchi at the confluence of two rivers just below a glacier in the middle of the map, and then the zigzag line representing the border um, in Lumnang village just on the bottom of the map. But for people living in the region, in that area, the border did not matter. Social relations and economic practices of Lapchi women and men transcended state boundaries on a regular basis. In the first half of the 20th century, the Lapchi borderland therefore resembled what James Scott calls a non-state space. That is a place where the sovereign power of a state is experienced as incomplete 
and becomes visible only through its distant presence. The nature of the borderland, however, changed after China's integration of Tibet in the 1950s. Diplomatic relations between Nepal and China were formalized, and both states adopted a series of boundary agreements and treaties to officially settle their shared Himalayan border. Over two years between 1961 and 1963, a boundary working group carried out the demarcation. The team took into consideration mountain peaks and passes, but also the habitual cross-border movement of local people for grazing and trading purposes. As a result, the shape of the border changed significantly in a number of places. 18 previously Tibetan villages were traded to Nepal in exchange for 10 Nepali villages that became Chinese. Residents of these villages were given the choice to either stay in their home villages and adopt a new citizenship or sell their land and resettle across the new border if they wanted to maintain the nationality. And people were given a one year period to reconsider their position. But to choose a single citizenship was new for many of the affected border populations who often had a sense of belonging like across the borderland. Identities and loyalties were not attached to a single state. So through these territorial reconfiguration in the 60s, Lapchi is now firmly integrated into Nepal, but social and economic connections to the TAR still define local livelihoods. As I mentioned before, members of the Lapchi community spend around six to seven months of the year on Tibetan pastures for which they have to pay a grazing charge. Many women in the region are also originally from the TAR, from places like Tashikang, Dram, Nyalam, um, and as far as Shigatse, from where they married to Lapchi. Until Recently, um, movement across the border continued more or less unhindered and in 2002 has been sanctioned by a so-called border citizen card that allows Nepali borderland residents and thus the people of Lapchi to travel up to 30 kilometers into the TAR without a passport or visa, depending on where the nearest accessible market town is located. And this is how a border citizen card looks like. Um, it's uh, not from Lapchi, uh, but from a friend of mine from Tsum in the Manaslu conservation area uh, in North Angoka district. The border citizen card provides a striking example of how China and Nepal mutually assert sovereignty over the region by creating a borderland that comprises portions of both countries' territory. The document also represents a form of legal recognition of people's cross-border livelihood practices and um, allegiances and identities. But what for a long time seemed to have been a borderland characterized by permissiveness and flows has changed. In 2013, Chinese authorities constructed a rotating camera near the border in Lapchi to monitor movement uh, across the borderland. They connected the camera to electricity poles that lead all the way up to Tashikang, where an armed police force is stationed. Besides a camera, the Chinese had also intended to build a fence at the border but the concrete they transported to the construction site was not strong enough to solidify over the large amount of steel required at this altitude. The plan of a fence was ultimately abandoned and the remaining bags of cement were sold to Lapchi villages. People did not report an incident involving the camera so far, but in general, they identify the arrival of the border cam as the moment from which onwards uh, policies became more restrictive. They associate the camera with a feeling of general unease. 
these sort of ambiguous relations with China intensified once local government elections in Nepal were held in 2017 and the transition to rural municipalities was completed a year later in 2018. Constitutional changes have facilitated a direct communication with Chinese state authorities. And this is something that happened all across Nepal's northern borderlands. The elected chairpersons of a rural municipality bordering the TAR, along with what representatives and local police officers have been invited to participate in formal meetings in China, where they can discuss and ask for a demand-based provision of development support, ranging from food, education, and healthcare to blasting material for road construction. These cross-border meetings build upon a previous memorandum of understanding signed between the Nepali and Chinese governments in 2014, according to which China pledged to contribute around 1.5 million US dollars annually for a period of five years to foster economic development in all northern border districts. This document uh, that you can see here states that Chinese aid will be directed towards small scale programs for improving local living standards. In Lapchi, uh, cross-border meetings take, up, uh, take place up to twice a year. They are usually held in Shelkar, as this is where the Tingri County administration um, across the border is located. But sometimes participants also convene on one of the pasture lands near the border. Apart from development support, these meetings also serve to formulate rules and regulations concerning trade, taxes, um, and movement. For example, people from Lapchi upon crossing the border have to register with their border citizen card in Tashikang. And when returning, they have to check back out. They're allowed to stay up to four days in the TAR, where they must seek accommodation in a hotel that has the necessary license to house foreigners. No interactions with Chinese citizens are permitted, except for the purpose of selling animal products and buying food and other merchandise. These regulations obviously shape and constrain the mobility of borderland populations. They affect where and when people choose and are permitted to cross the border, purchase and sell products, and communicate with other like traders um, or businessmen. In addition to these cross-border meetings, there are also so-called police cooperation conferences that target, as the name indicates, police personnel in particular. And here you can see a picture from such a conference that took place in 2018, during which policemen were trained in the correct enforcement of rules and regulations regarding the shared border management. But there are also a couple other concrete plans that wait to be implemented and will have even more widely sorry, applicable effects. Um, when I visited Lapchi earlier this year, several people told me that the Nepali government will establish a border police camp and check post near Lapchi village. The camp is expected to host 40 men, which is quite a lot when you consider that not more than 50 people live in Lapchi village itself. The armed police forces are already stationed in Lama Bagar at the army camp there near the Tamakoshi hydropower project waiting to go up to Lapchi. The other debated issue was the clearing of ground for the construction of a large trading center near the border in the TAR. And talking about the prospect of a shopping complex at the border, one of my friends named Kunchok said, um, and I cite here, 
you know, the Chinese offer us the chance to do easy business, saying that we can trade there free of any cost. But what happens if we are not allowed to go to Tashikang afterwards? Um, and Kunshok looked at me like really sternly with his like bushy eyebrows pursed. Um, he clearly pointed out the overall concern that many people in Lapchi express. At present, uh, no one oversees what moves across the border. And while some people fear that the policing of the border and infrastructures of surveillance will lead to greater control, others believe that in the future, crossing the border might not be possible at all. These actions to secure the border and mark state territory are representative for broader spatial manifestations of power across the Nepal-China borderland, where fences, custom control centers, and police posts are in different stages of planning and operation. And I speak here of Mustang, for example, or also of Tsum in the Northern Gorka district. Due to unforeseen and unfortunate events, People in Lapchi are currently experiencing how such a life without access to the TAR might look like. The border to Tashikang has remained closed since the earliest weeks of the coronavirus outbreak, generating an unprecedented situation of austerity. The Nepali news reported that the main northern land crossings in Razubagadi and Tatopani were shut for several months at a time, restricting the flow of goods on container trucks into Nepal to such a degree that some businessmen have even accused China of conducting an undeclared trade blockade. But not much information has been available on local and small scale border crossings in the mountains. In Lapchi, where people are dependent on grasslands and markets across the border, the closure has led to a complete standstill of local economies. People cannot take their animals to grasslands in the TAR, resulting in overgrazed pastures on the Nepali side. They cannot sell animals and dairy products to Tashikang, leaving them without income. And they cannot buy food staples like barley and buckwheat. What is even worse, Tibetans from Tashikang took their own herds to pastures that people of Lapchi are normally using. These events have generated a plausible fear um, and people were literally begging Chinese authorities to open the border. Um, the inquiries actually helped uh, and the Chinese allowed for one single trading day uh, at the border under strict security measurements and with no people to people contact. In this current moment of the global pandemic and increasing border securitization, thinking about the future took on a new immediacy for members of the Lapchi community. Interestingly, they did not succumb to feelings of nausea or disenchantment. They did not feel apathy or exhaustion toward the future. In a recurring situation of crisis, they still have hope and anticipation. Um, this was at least the case in March before the second COVID wave hit Nepal. And most important, two current reorientations is, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, the widespread anticipation of the future Lapche Kola hydroelectric project that will also include an access road and transmission line. This form of rural development will, so people believe, generate alternative economic opportunities by connecting Lapche and Lumnang villages to the national road network and electric grid. Discussions on a potential hydropower project in the Lapchi region were ongoing ever since construction on the Tamakushi project in Lamabaga commenced. But it was not before August last year in 2020 
that a joint Nepali, Australian and Canadian team conducted the topographical survey that was necessary for the building of the different hydropower components. The team did an aerial survey using LIDAR, that's an advanced laser scanning technique, which produces extremely accurate digital 3D representation of areas on the Earth's surface. This survey confirmed existing plans for two main project sites, one a short walk down below Long Nam village, and another at a pasture land called Tang Chemu, halfway up on the way to Lapchi. Um, and I have the map here again for orientation. Whereas the headworks area, including a dam and crusher plant, will be at Tang Chemu, the third shaft and powerhouse will be near Lumnang. The site near Lumnang is also expected to have office buildings and a health post, which will be available for Lapchi people as well. Um, and these two images are just for fun. Uh, there's screenshots from a non-commercial video, from private video, compiled by uh, KB Buhara, the deputy project manager. The Lapchikola hydroelectric project is expected to generate a power output of 160 megawatt and is estimated to cost around 26 billion Nepali rupee. It is constructed by NASA Hydropower, a subsidiary of the MV Duga Group. The owner of the MV Duga Group is Motilal Dugar, who was the Minister for Industry, Commerce and Supplies from 2019 to 2020. And I believe he even was uh, appointed special economic advisor to Prime Minister Oli earlier this year. The Lapche Kola hydroelectric project currently is one of the largest projects developed by the private sector in Nepal. In September last year, three excavators and two tractors were then airlifted to Lumnang from Lamabaga. The heavy machines were disassembled as much as possible, and their parts were either transported inside uh, one of those large MI-17 helicopters or fastened on a, sling, uh, on a sling line to then be reassembled at the project site in Lumnang. And this is how <clears throat> the camp at Lumnang village looks like at present. Uh, I have taken these pictures when I visited the area in March. You can see um, a kitchen here, a tea house, um, greenhouses for fresh, fresh vegetables, um, which are otherwise like very rare in the area, an open fireplace, a seating area, um, and insulated tents. I was surprised to see how well established the camp is. There are currently around 13 people stationed in each camp who work on the access road. Construction takes place simultaneously from Lumnang to Lamabaga in the south and towards the second camp at Tang Chengmu at the north. So road construction is happening in two directions at the same time. And people work in shifts for 24 hours, creating a constant noise level like from the drilling in the area. While construction on the access road in the lower Lapchi Valley is well underway, it is not decided who will build the remaining part of the road from the plant dam site at Tang Chengmu up to Lapchi village and further north across the border, like the Gaupalika, the district, the Department of Roads, or a combination of all of them. The Chinese also already signaled their interest to provide the funds and expertise to help establish the connection with the already existing road in the TAR, but people in Lapchi express concerns that this may lead to an even greater Chinese influence and surveillance in the area. Given the recurring insecurities around border, border crossing since the coronavirus outbreak, people now hope that the recent development programs in the region will generate alternative economic opportunities. In particular, they look toward tourism as the main income provider that will replace traditional pastoralist practices that require access to rangelands in the TAR. 
In fact, um, as one villager told me, while sitting um, around the fireplace in his home in Lumnang, once the road is completed, we will not depend on the herding of livestock anymore. We might keep a few of our animals for making butter and cheese, but we will not have to sell them to Tibet anymore. Because Lapchi is an important Buddhist pilgrimage site, tourists will gradually come into the valley. We will slowly earn more money, but in order for us to do so, it is important that we invest in guest houses and shops now. This statement reflects the opinion of many people in Lapchi I talked with. And while some are already channeling investment in an emerging tourism economy and have established tracking companies, others have begun to uh, make incense and tea from locally available uh, medicinal plants uh, and herbs uh, that they sell in Lapchi as well as in Kathmandu. There are also concrete ideas to establish a community hotel um, or a resort at a hillside in the valley that has hot springs. The most profound plans of rural transformation, however, were recounted to me by Kamar Oeser, the current president of the Lapchi Association. And he said in one conversation, I believe that in the future we will permanently live in Lapchi village. This is where most pilgrimage places are located and where tourists would want to come. Lumnang then will be a place where people can stay along the way. What really struck me in all of these conversations was that the anticipation of a future tourism economy is not in a fraud relationship with the road as it can be observed, for example, in the Annapurna or Manaslu regions. On the contrary, prospects of the future in Lapchi are predicated upon the arrival of a motorable connection to Kathmandu. So the shared anticipation of tourism brought by the road legitimates actions in the present, such as the abandoning of transhumans and the permanent relocation to Lapchi village. This might not have been acceptable under other circumstances. So in an unpleasant present, defined by a prolonged period of border closure and austerity, the idea of the road produces affects, a strong and focused sense of anticipation. People not only ready themselves, but also actively press forward into the future and acting it through the establishment of tracking companies and guest houses, and thereby pulling the future toward the present. But the question remains, what happens if this working and living towards the future fails? What if the anticipated outcome does not materialize? There are many imponderabilities to consider, and one for sure lies in the nature of infrastructure projects itself. Greg Heatherington writes that the tense of infrastructure, like of any development project really, is the future perfect, an anticipatory state around which people gather their promises and aspirations. But the paradox is that infrastructures do not arrive in a finished state, quite the reverse. As many recent studies have shown, uh, political shifts or local opposition, but also cost overrun and lack of investment can elongate or maybe even discontinue a project's planning, assessment and construction. Many, if not most, like dams, roads, railroads, airports and pipelines exist in states that can be characterized as unbuilt or unfinished. They are planned, but then delayed or abandoned. And in the context of Nepal, this infrastructural delay, these long periods of waiting is something we all can relate to very well. We only need to think of the Milamchi water supply project, for example, where contracts awarded to companies were canceled, corruption issues surfaced, 
and accidents continuously postponed uh, Kathmandu's urgently needed supply with drinking water. As a result, the social experiences and like different affective states associated with the Melamchi project ranged from hope and anxiety to waiting and then disillusionment. Stalled infrastructure projects are everywhere. They're ubiquitous. They are the norm rather than the exception. So the important question consequently is not to paraphrase Susan Leistar and Karen Rühleder, like what is infrastructure, but when? And once completed, once built, infrastructures and roads are in need of constant maintenance and repair, improvisation and labor, especially in mountainous terrain, like we have in Nepal. Monsoon rainfalls cause landslides that block roads each summer, obstructing like smooth passage and washing away bridges. So let me come to a conclusion. While at the individual level, anticipation pervades actions of everyday life, at the collective level, we find that anticipation is linked to particular moments of uncertain or threatening futures as the scenarios of the global pandemic and border securitization in Leipzig show. Anticipation in these incidences or in these cases is a collective way of addressing fears and of intentionally altering something that threatens a radical revision of the present. In Lapchi, the prospects of road development and a future tourism economy give people orientations, modes of actions, and intentionalities in a time of rupture. People establish tracking companies and make concrete plans for the building of hotels um, or resorts. They consider giving up their pastoral practices and move to Lapchi village, something that might not have um, been done uh, otherwise. These are all actions that convey temporalities, um, actions that project the present into the future and also attempt to shape the future and the present. And ultimately, these are actions or plans that help people to deal with an ongoing crisis in a borderland region. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Nadine, for your presentations. Uh, now I open floor and I welcome questions and comments from our audience. Actually, um, I'm interested to know more about uh, the effect of uh, CCTVs uh, in the border areas. You talk about, uh, I think, uh, sec securitization of border or something. So can you mm -hmm. uh, tell more on the implication or the possible implication of these uh, CCTVs uh, in the border land? Mm. <clears throat> mm. I just see, can you still see my camera? Oh, yes. Yeah, we can per see. Oh, perfect. Um, so the CCTV camera in Lapchi was built or was established in 2013. Um, and to my knowledge, uh, it wasn't only established in Lapchi, but um, all across Nepal's northern borderlands, like different forms of camera or uh, modes um, to monitor movement across the border uh, were built. Um, in Lapchi, of course, like um, in an area that is not very densely populated and that in the past was not very strictly monitored, the border, um, the border camera um, really generated like 
fears or anxieties like what will happen can are, will we be able like to move across the border in the future um will we need to show our border permit or the border citizen card more often um like will there be a check post um so these were all thoughts that uh, that people that people were were having um the border camera, the CCTV camera was then like destroyed um, in like during the earthquake, uh, but then also fixed again, like a couple, a couple years, a couple years later. Um, so now um, actually like a story that was told to me um, by uh, someone working at the Lapchikola hydropower project. Um, like involved in the management there said like that when they crossed the border um, and walked by the camera like half an hour later drones were coming um, then like a couple of weeks later someone told me that this story might actually not be true in total um, but it still reflects um, like an, a feeling of tension um, for 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 people yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions? Sam, yeah, please. Thank you, Nadine. Brilliant talk. And I learned a lot from it. I sent in a question about the missing border pillar 57 mm -hmm. and whether you had ever met anyone or heard of anyone who knew where this border pillar was at some stage. But really, my wider question is that this is uh, this is the one piece of the Nepal-China border that is not um, signed up to. Uh, and I was wondering whether the fact that this is not being signed up to, and both sides seem to have taken a very entrenched view on where the border should be, uh, relevant to where this border pillar 57 might be, has that had any manifestation, uh, that tension, has that had any manifestation on how China has handled all of the stuff that you talked to us about. <clears throat> Thanks, Sam. Um, this was a great question. Um, so um, just for the others in the audience, um, some contextualization uh, to Sam questions. Before then, I will, uh, I will try to, to answer your question um, that directly. Um, so Lapchi is regarded one of the areas where land is still disputed. Apart from Kalapani um, in Western Nepal, the Lipo Lake issue, or then also like Susta uh, in, uh, in, in the Tarai in Southern Nepal. So the issue surrounding Lapchi is that um, while border pillars can be found on the western border crossings to Tashikang. Um, those are border pillars 55 and 56. Um, and border pillars can also be found on the eastern crossing, uh, border pillars like 58 and 59. Number 50, uh, 57, as Sam uh, pointed out, is missing. Um, so, and in or uh, within like the past or during the past decades, um, China is claiming an area um, of basically mountain and rock site that also Nepal claims. Um, local people in the area actually, Sam said, that um, it's not a border pillar, the number 57, that it is more a rock site um, on which, like the the number uh, on which the number was engraved. So, and this because it was only a rock site, um, and landslides of course can happen in the area, and you have like weather, like a weathering, and like rainfall, and so on. The winds, it might not um, be possible to actually locate the like yeah not the pillar but like the sign the sign anymore um 
it, but people say in the past they saw it, but also like forgot like where it was concretely. They can only pinpoint it out in, in a way. Um, but for the border management uh, or for the shared border management and ongoing practices of securitization, um, like the camera um, Hasha was addressing, um, or also um, like the the mall or the shopping, the trading center that is going to be established, um, like ideas to establish a fence, like this missing pillar um, or border sign does not, or in my view, like from, from what I've heard, from what I've experienced, does not affect the border management. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Could I ask a supplementary very quickly uh, about the viability of Lapchi as a, a tourist site in the future? Obviously, from what I've read, winters in Lapchi are quite yeah. hard and long. And then the monsoon also has an impact, uh, quite severe in that area. So I wonder where, what the period of when these tourists uh, are going to be expected and whether the limited number of months that this would be open for tourism, I'm talking about the normal tourist, okay. uh, does not limit the prospects for tourism in the area. Thank you. Um, as you've observed, like winters in Lapchi are quite harsh. Um, so snow um, is reported to sometimes be like a meter, one and a half meter, two meters high. Um, that when people are in the village or also like the meditators on the mountains that they can barely move in between houses or like their, their meditation caves. Um, snowfall usually starts in December and can go until late April. Um, in, but it also changed. Um, people say it's less and less snowing. Um, okay. Monsoon rains start um, in yeah usually July, go until September, sometimes reaching into October. Um, the difficult part with monsoon is that so far every year the walking trail down to Lama Baga has been washed away by landslides. Yeah. Um, people try not to walk down to the south because it's so dangerous. There is an alternative route that people also used after the earthquake across the Kukuraja range. Mm -hmm. It takes three days total, but it's extremely dangerous because people need to cross a river. There's no bridge and the river can also be like very high. Um, people used that route when Lap like, yeah, for about a year after the earthquake, one and a half years when Lapchi was also cut off, like from Lama Baga and the rest of Nepal. Um, so the terrain also makes, of course, road construction extremely difficult to bring tourists um, on buses, for example, or private jeeps. So what people hope, um, or what also now, especially the Lapchi Association and Kathmandu fosters, um, is at the one hand, uh, individual trekking tourism, groups of like two people, four people, uh, but then also, um, more guided tours for especially people from uh, China and Southeast Asia for Buddhists, for Buddhist okay. people. Um, and for them, a road would be, would be much more convenient, of course, than for individual, for individual uh, trekkers. But the window, as you mentioned, is extremely limited uh, for, for tourism. It would be, yeah, let's say, starting in April and yeah, maybe until June, April until June. And then again, August to uh, yeah, September, not August, maybe September uh, to December. Um, I went to Lapchi in December um, and also like in November, December, um, also walked to the area in October once in, March, April, but have never been there during the summer. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you, Nadine. Very good. Thank, thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, 
there is a question. Um, I think uh, uh, there is a question on, in chat. It says, um, is that border citizen card permanent? I didn't see any expiry date. <laughs> it's from Good Devraj. Question. Yeah. <laughs> um, Good question. Um, from what I know, it is permanent until you lose it um, and then you can make a new one. Um, in the past, uh, people could make it or for, it was possible for people to make the border citizenship at the district headquarter. Um, now, like with administrative changes to rural municipalities, it is also possible uh, to get them at the center of, uh, of the Gaupanika, but they are permanent. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's another question from GF Taylor. Uh, I didn't understand why the fence couldn't be built. Sound, sounds like an interesting story. <laughs> Um, thanks for that question. It is an interesting story, um, but I can only relate to what people told me and I'm not an expert in engineering and construction in high altitude regions um, or in areas like above 4000 meter. So what people said that, um, or like a road actually from Tashikang um, an all weather road, an unpaved road, like more a dirt track, goes um, until to almost where the camera is located um, that you've seen on, on the picture before and where um, the Chinese intended to build the, uh, the build the fence. So people told me that the materials to construct the fence were brought, including the cement, but then when they started building that the Chinese realized the cement didn't work out, like that it didn't solidify, um, that it didn't become hard at that altitude. Or people said it's the altitude, but I'm not entirely sure if that is actually can be the case, seeing also um, Chinese development programs in like the TAR, um, like the train, for example, uh, that goes to Lhasa um, and like dams that are being built that actually really require uh, a lot of expertise like in, um, in those regions. So I'm, I'm wondering in a way, yeah, what maybe the real reason was behind it or was it like really the concrete or might there have been another uh, reason, but, but that, I don't, that I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. It's from Galen Morton. It says, what have experience with, with, without migration been like in Latsi? Are there any youth left there? And do older residents anticipate that their children will return, especially with the possible advent of the tourism industry? Since Latsi has a relative, relatively small population to begin with, I'm curious if the anticipation of the future perfect uh, include a return in migration of local youth or other any newcomers as well? Um, thanks, Galen, uh, for this question. Um, yeah, there's almost no young people left in Lapchi, unfortunately. Um, most, most children in the past were sent uh, to TCV schools in India, uh, to Tibetan children villages uh, schools in India. Uh, now, actually, this changed. Um, I think it was around five years ago, uh, five to eight years ago, that the Lapchi Association in Kathmandu uh, like rented or established, like rented a house and established a so-called like youth um, hostel um, and kindergarten in Kathmandu um, from where people then can also go to schools in Kathmandu. So what the people are trying or what Lapchi people are trying is keeping people more in Nepal or keeping children more in Nepal than actually sending them, uh, sending them to, to India. Um, 
but so far it's in it's incredibly rare that people come back to Lapchi. Um, what the Lapchi Association and especially Kama Oeser, its president, um, and also his wife, who is actually an English teacher in a school in Kathmandu, try um, to create bridges or to create this uh, like continuing cultural contact between Kathmandu and Lapchi is that during the design holidays, they take group of children to their parents in Lapchi. They walk up with them to Lapchi. Um, also that they don't uh, use the language skills in the region. So Tibetan speaker, uh, people speak a Tibetan dialect up there, um, but also that they um, are continuously aware of cultural, cultural and religious, of religious traditions. Um, interestingly, in like now in March, when I was in Lapchi, uh, I met a person who uh, did a BA degree in computer engineering in informatics, I think also uh, in uh, Bangalore in India. Uh, and he in the future um, anticipates to help people in Lapchi. But of course, we all don't know how future ideas will uh, will work out. But out migration is an issue. And yeah, as we've also seen, the community is very small. It's about 25 houses in Lapchi, 40 to 50 people living there, mainly middle aged elderly. Yeah, it's it's a difficult question. Um, people do hope uh, that tourism or new economic incentives will maybe bring people uh, children back from Kathmandu. But yeah, but that is not sure. Thanks for the question again. Thanks. Mm. And now uh, this question uh, from Pratishwanta, please let's uh, Yeah, Nadine, uh, many thanks for the presentation. I wonder if you could say something in comparative terms uh, uh, with respect to uh, orientations, your argument about orientations to the future with respect to infrastructure projects, uh, comparing what you've described for us today in Lapchi with what others have been writing about uh, in other parts of the Nepal Himalayas or even the Indian Himalayas. So, so in other words, you know, mm -hmm. locating it, locating what you uh, described to us with respect to Lapchi in the, in the larger Himalayan region, would that be possible? Mm -mm. Um, I try my best. <laughs> um, so my PhD research for example, was located in the Tsum region in the uh, Manaslu conservation area of Northern Gorkha district. Um, and as we all know, now the Nepali army constructs a road um, from uh, like Arugat um, up to Nubri and also towards uh, Tsum on uh, the Buri Gandaki, on the Buri Gandaki River Valley. Um, there are also plans to establish or to construct a, a major massive hydropower project in the region. Um, yeah, but the army now builds a road there um, in the Buri Gandaki Valley. Um, in, um, apart from that in 2013, also an excavator was, air, was airlifted into Tsum to start road construction on an altitude of around like 3,500 meter, but not towards the south, um, towards the north, to connect with a road in the TAR that then leads to Kirong, actually, and, and to Tsongka. Um, and here it was very interesting to see, especially when we think of different like temporalities and orientations. Um, to the future, toward the future, um, that at the beginning, um, people had a lot of hopes and expectations, um, especially uh, for trade uh, with uh, with Tibet, uh, with markets, with markets in China. But then, seeing that road construction took place like an, at an incredibly low speed over the years, um, like 
sometimes not happening at all for several months at a time because like the excavator broke down because um, there was no petrol available people couldn't get like like repairments um, people got disillusioned at one point um, the road in Zum, for example is still not finished now what is now almost eight nine years later um, and that's only like in the second half of, of the upper valley. So also like orientations can change um, from like anticipation, uh, expectation, um, also maybe speculation, potentialities, what can happen to like, as I mentioned before, maybe disenchantment, disillusionment, um, through these ongoing and long periods of, uh, of waiting. Um, but of course, like what we can see all across Nepal, that um, infrastructure programs and especially roads um, to connect borderland regions with China um, are being built. Um, and we have Mustang here, for example, but also Dolpo, um, I think, yeah, Mugu, I'm exactly not sure, I have to say, but definitely um, in Western Nepal, in Humla, also um, near Walong, Olang Junkola. So these projects take place all over, um, all over Nepal. Um, and like this, those infrastructure programs, of course, also do come like new modes of, of securitization. I hope that helped to answer that uh, that question. Mm. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, um, we have a question from Avasphia. Avasi, do you want to put your question yourself? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, my question was regarding <clears throat> this idea that how infrastructures, you know, can be besides its points of. Um, uh, heightened moments of when it's being made or when it breaks down at other times it sort of slips in slips, slips away into invisibility right uh, mm -hmm. so but there's something about cctv especially at the border that does not allow that to happen and there's some kind of heightened state most all the time right so i was thinking what are your thoughts on it that's a really good comment um Avash, really um, because we usually think of um, that infrastructure, so when we look at the literature on infrastructure, um, we have this common perception that actually infrastructure become visible through their breakdown, like through their non-functioning. Um, because usually like infrastructures like run, like we take them for granted, they run on the side, they run on the surface. And, um, but we become aware of them in our daily lives when just something does not happen as we expect it to happen, like this invisibility of infrastructure. But the border camera, I mean, it's obvious. Um, you see it, you walk by it, um, and you're never really sure what it sees. Is it functioning? Is um, someone looking at you? Um, is a tape just running and recording just in case? Um, yeah, it's um, it's a contrast to what we otherwise experience or what we see as the invisibility of other like infrastructures as as roads, um, for example, dams, railroads, um, electricity poles, and and so on. Yeah, thanks thanks for saying that and pointing that out. Mm -mm. Thank you. Uh, Prashanta has uh, Apollo, please, personally. Uh, Narin, uh, are, are you aware of, or uh, maybe this is something that uh, you should uh, discuss with uh, fellow academics who work on, on the Himalayan borderlands. It, I think it would be really good to have a collection out that is available in Nepal. So maybe with mm. a Nepali publisher or with a publisher based out of New Delhi. Uh, not necessarily only with new articles, but articles that are already out there in various journals that are usually not accessible to people based in Nepal. To put, put together a, a, a volume on Himalayan borderlands 
that uh, that in a way represents the new US scholarship from social anthropology and geography that uh, are related to some of the discussions, some of the concerns that you have discussed today. So are you aware of any such volumes that are being created? Or if not, I think maybe you should uh, you should chat with 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 your colleagues uh, along this line. Uh, thank you, Pratyush. I mean, that is really a great idea, actually. I'm not aware of any of those volumes at the moment. Um, there is one edited volume that is in preparation right now, um, and that is, I think, going to be published sometime later this year uh, on Highland Asia in general, like on Highland Asian uh, on regions in Highland Asia, different aspects of it, like history, but also touching on infrastructure in parts. Um, but of course, it does not cover Nepal in particular. There's also an edited volume that was just recently published uh, by Amsterdam University Press on development zones in Asian borderlands and two chapters, I think two chapters on Nepal are in this volume as well, two or three, no, three actually. Um, but a, an edited volume, a book that compiles only um, Nepali cases um, does not exist at present. But of course, there is like really um, uh, a group of people and amazing scholarship done right now at present. Um, we have, for example, like yeah, Gail Merton, who is here uh, with us today in the audience who works on Mustang um, or also on the Razuva, on the Razuva corridor. Um, Austin Lodge, who's doing a lot of work on hydropower projects, uh, Rupak Shrestha um, at the University of Colorado Boulder, who is working in, in Valung in eastern Nepal. We have Poba Dondrup um, from Dolpo, who also works uh, in Dolpo and in Humla. So there's, um, yeah, there's actually really a great group of people, um, and these were just a few that I mentioned, who work uh, in the Nepal Himalaya. And it would be, yeah, I keep that in mind, Pratyush. Thank you very much. Maybe we can do something. Um, yeah, if not like publish um, articles or that were already published, but also maybe just write, um, yeah, come up, write up uh, our research for a volume um, that has not been published already, yeah. Thanks. I wrote that down. I really keep that in mind. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do we have other questions? Uh, if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand or you can put uh, directly. Sam, do you have? Yeah, I'll please. just, uh, well, uh, since we're coming to the end, it struck me very powerfully something that's been put to me elsewhere. The government of Nepal should really value the people who live in these border areas. Mm. Because take the case of um, Lapchi. This is a bitter dispute. They can't settle the border. Nepal feels very strongly about the area that Lapchi is in. Mm. But yet without these 25 families or the remnant of those who remain, what would the presence of the state be? So it strikes me as if there's a very powerful case for the Nepal government to up the ante and start supporting the people in these remote border areas who live in very harsh conditions who actually represent the state, not just on maps, but through reality. That would be my final comment. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, Sam. Um, and like, this is really something that was, uh, I mean, now that would open up like a completely different topic, but like, it's like, especially the earthquake has has shown, like, or in Lapchi has shown um, that the government, yeah, is actually not caring so much uh, for the people, like, in the area. Um, yeah, people were cut off for a very long time from the rest of Nepal. Help did not come. Um, yeah, so actually having, having yeah, a stronger sense of including borderland populations, um, but not only in the north, also in the south. Um, I think it goes, it goes it really in both, it goes in both directions. Um, or like, 
include marginalized communities in in general is really the way uh yeah we need we, we need to go mm. thanks Nadine. Mm. and thank you do we have other questions i think we don't have um that means now we have to end uh, the program uh do you have anything to say Nadine? at the end um just thank you all very much um to you hasha to produce to rook like uh to um whoever who all uh, organized the webinar it was really a great pleasure for me uh, to be able to present aspects of my research and then also to hear all your interesting uh, comments and questions and i really hope that this presentation has opened up um some new avenues to think about borderlands, uh, to think about marginalized communities um, yeah, in the current moment, the current situation of, of Nepal. Uh, I think Thank get, you all for participating. Yeah, uh, before, before ending, I think there's a question from Galen. Galen, I think you raise your hand. Oh, I, I was just doing the, the applause hand <laughs> and, <laughs> and also echoing Sam's comment on the importance of, of borderland populations and histories and dynamics that are too often overlooked. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Nadine, and all uh, for coming to today's pro program. Yeah, bye. See you in the next program. Thank you very thank you, much. Nadine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.